The following program, The Russ Belleville Show, is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate to the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate any illegal activity and encourage all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers on The Russ Belleville Show are their own, and The Russ Belleville Show cannot be held legally responsible for their validity or reliability. Viewer discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. And it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. Yeah! From the promise of legalization. To the agony of prohibition. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The Ruff Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Yeah, I hear you You had a question for me. Now, here's your host, Radical Russ Belleville. Oh, welcome back, everybody. It is Wednesday, October 10th, 2012, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. I am so glad to be back here at beautiful Rolla J Studios in Potland, Oregon. Sitting next to me, we got Brian the Red hanging out. How you doing, Brian? I'm doing just fine, Russ. Hey, we got a reggae flashback coming up tonight? We do indeed, and I'm still trying to get it all lined up, so that's what I'll be doing later. 8 o'clock Pacific time, reggae flashback. You yes, want to check sir. that out with Red Eyes right here. Red Eyes reggae flashback. We get deep into the roots of the Irie music. You're going to really dig it, so check that out. Uh, Cannabis Carry is off today. We uh, got back from Los Angeles late. Late tonight, I missed our first flight from Long Beach, had to take the later flight, so Carrie's got the day off as she catches up with her work assignments, but we have got a phenomenal show for you today. Coming up first, we're going to start off with our hemp headlines, all sorts of uh, news to bring you here uh, from the, the cannabis community. I just got back from the normal national conference. I'm going to give you the lowdown on what you may have been reading around the net of a shakeup at normal, considering uh, the executive director, the executive board, all sorts of things going on from Los Angeles. I'll give you all the details you need to know about it coming up uh, in our headlines. Also, uh, stories coming out from Montana. We've got uh, uh, some Amtrak bus that have gone on there. We've got some other headlines, including the uh, Oregonian, which I'll be taking a look at in our uh, radical rant at the end of the show, which has uh, come out <laughs> in support of these higher fees for medical marijuana uh, card holders for patients, you know, taxing the sick people, basically. Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., the boxer, was temporarily suspended. We'll talk about that uh, for his marijuana test. Some new TV ads are coming out for I-502. The ACLU is suing the state of Rhode Island over their medical marijuana program. And in San Diego, a landmark case will be heard that could affect medical marijuana dispensaries throughout the Golden State. We'll take a look at that in our 420 headline news. Then we're going to go behind the headlines. I talked about the uh, shakeup at Normal. Behind the headlines, we're going to show you video of Alan St. Pierre at the Normal Conference in Los Angeles calling for a 420 march on Washington, D.C. <laughs> Coming up in 2013, that's a Saturday by the way, it'll be a really good day to get a march together in Washington, D.C. At half past the hour, we're going to reach out to Dr. Mitch Earlywine. I don't know if he's made it back from normal conference yet or not. We're still putting things together. We'll see if we got Dr. Mitch on the line for our cannabis Q&A segment. And like I mentioned earlier, at the end of the show, time for a radical rant. I'm taking on the Oregonians' vacuity, cruelty, and mercilessness with respect to the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program. All that and more coming up on the Russ Belleville Show. We love each and every one of you. Toke up and stick around. Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Honey, our ballots came in the mail today. I can't wait to cast my vote for Measure 80. Measure 80? Is that the one to legalize marijuana? I don't know about that. Why not? Marijuana is far safer than alcohol. 
I know that, but I worry about kids smoking pot. It's easier for kids to buy pot than beer because clerks check for proper ID. Sure, but what about stone drivers? We've had medical marijuana for 14 years, and yet our traffic safety stats are better now than before medical marijuana. Okay, but what about people coming in stone to work? Come on now, honey. Oregon's workplaces are safer than ever, and we have over 50,000 medical marijuana patients. Nothing about Measure 80 prevents employers from maintaining drug-free workplaces. I know change is scary, but Oregon really needs jobs and tax revenue, and Measure 80 will provide them. Okay, safer for kids and tax revenue for our state? Makes sense to me. I'm voting yes on Measure 80. Paid for by Oregonians for Law Reform, OregonLawReform.com. Warning, hits taken on this show are larger than they appear. Do not try this at home. These people are professionals. <coughs> or at least they pay me to say that. Man, is that the reaper man? That's the reaper man. I believe he's losing his mind. I think he's lost his mind. This is a Russ Belleville Show news alert. Whatever you do, don't smoke pot. You don't want to turn out to be a loser like Olympian Michael Phelps, actor Jack Nicholson, singer Miley Cyrus, rocket scientist Dr. Carl Sagan, pop star Rihanna, actress Cameron Diaz, country legend Willie Nelson, President Barack Obama, Cy Young pitcher Kim Lincecum. Oh, have you ever Seth met Goldberg, that President funny reaper man? Man. man? Have you ever met that funny reaper man? man? If he says he swam to China, he tells you South Carolina, then you know you're talking to that reaper man. And over 100 million other Americans. Have you ever met a funny reaper man? If he says he walks the ocean, any time he takes a notion, then you know you're talking to the reaper man. Now it's time for your 420 headline news with Carrie Gallagher. Carrie's off the, for the day. I'm Russ Belleville with the news. San Diego court to hear landmark medical marijuana dispensary case. This from Americans for Safe Access. Appellate court ar oral arguments are set to occur Thursday in a widely watched medical marijuana dispensary case that raises the question of what defines a legitimate dispensary. Nearly a year ago, medical marijuana patient advocacy group Americans for Safe Access, or ASA, appealed the September 2010 conviction of San Diego dispensary operator Jovan Jackson. The case against Jackson became a symbol of the effort by District Attorney Bonnie DeManis and other prosecutors across the state to criminalize storefront collectives. ASA is appealing Jackson's conviction and denial of his defense. This will be oral arguments in People v. Jackson uh, happening tomorrow, Thursday, October 11th at 1.30 p.m. at the 4th District, 4th District Court of Appeal, 750 B Street, Suite 300 in San Diego. Now, ASA Chief Counsel Joe Elford, who filed the appeal and is arguing Thursday on Jackson's behalf, said, quote, Jackson and other medical marijuana providers are entitled to a defense under the state's medical marijuana laws. The denial of Jackson's defense was unfairly used to convict a medical marijuana provider who was in full compliance with state law. At Jackson's trial, San Diego Superior Court Judge Howard Shore referred to medical marijuana as dope and called California's medical marijuana laws a scam. Reporting from the Weed blog, the American Civil Liberties Union sues Rhode Island's Department of Health over a restrictive medical marijuana policy. The Rhode Island ACLU has filed a lawsuit in Superior Court against the State Department of Health for making it more difficult for patients with debilitating medical conditions to participate in the state's medical marijuana program. The suit, filed by Rhode Island ACLU volunteer attorney John Deneen, was brought on behalf of the Rhode Island Patient Advocacy Coalition, the Rhode Island Academy of Physician Assistants, and an individual whose application to participate in the medical marijuana program was denied by the Department of Health under the new policy. For the past six years that the medical marijuana law has been in effect, the Department of Health has acknowledged that physicians, registered nurse practitioners, and physician assistants can certify that a patient has a debilitating medical condition that qualifies him or her for participation in the medical marijuana program. They have been able to do so for patients with whom they have a bona fide practitioner-patient relationship and have completed a full assessment of their medical history.
In August, however, Department of Health Director Michael Fine summarily reversed course, issuing a memo that only certification signed by physicians would be accepted. The new policy was implemented without any public notice or input and was applied to and was applied to deny applications that had been pending for months. For example, plaintiff Peter Nunez Sr. applied for the program in June, but his application was held up into held up until September, despite a statutory obligation that applications must be processed within 35 days. When the Department of Health denied him his medical marijuana card because his certification had been signed by a registered nurse practitioner. The new restriction on the number of medical professionals who can make certifications has serious consequences for some patients, according to the plaintiffs. For example, veterans whose physicians work at the VA cannot obtain certifications from their federally employed doctor. Some other physicians, fearful of the publicity, stopped issuing certifications after a list of doctors who had signed the forms was made public two years ago. The uh, ex-middleweight boxing titleist Julio Cesar Chavez has been suspended, temporarily suspended, by the Nevada State, State Athletic Commission on Tuesday, according to Dan Raphael at ESPN.com, in an expected procedural move because of his positive test for marijuana in the wake of a unanimous decision loss to world champion Sergio Martinez on September 15th at the Thomas & Mack Center in Las Vegas. Executive Director Keith Kaiser told ESPN.com, quote, Mr. Chavez's license is suspended, but there is no finding of fact on the merits of the case. He had a license to fight in Nevada, and we suspended it pending a hearing. Chavez had no objection to it. He wasn't going to fight again this year anyway, end quote. And finally, in Billings, Montana, three people arrested for transmitting marijuana via Amtrak, according to tips from anonymous informants. Reminding you, Amtrak is now watching very closely for those shipments of marijuana. Please be careful out there. That's your 420 headline news for Wednesday, October 10th, 2012. I'm Russ Belville. When we come back, we go behind the headlines on the Shake Up at Normal, plus video of Alan St. Pierre's speech calling for a 420 march on Washington, D.C. This is the Russ Belville Show. We'll be right back. We're not looking to end beer summits at the White House or change the way people behave on the campaign trail. We just believe adults in the privacy of their homes should be allowed to use marijuana instead of alcohol if that's what they prefer. Forty years ago, our government launched an irrational war on marijuana for reasons unrelated to the actual and limited harms of the substance. It's time for a more sensible approach. It's time to regulate marijuana. Paid for by the campaign to regulate marijuana like alcohol. When I was in England, I experimented with marijuana a time or two, and I didn't like it. And didn't inhale, and never tried it again. I think you'd probably be a lot cooler if you had, Mr. President. I said, hey, do you have a joint kid? Sure would be hot cooler if you did light it. here behind the headlines we're going to take a look at the recent normal national conference 2012 in los angeles california at the omni hotel where there was uh, a lot of well what people are calling a shake-up at normal uh, a bit of misreporting actually coming out of celebstoner.com and i just wanted to get to the bottom of this for people that uh might have heard all the rumors out there. First of all, let me go to a video here because I want to start with Alan St. Pierre's closing speech at the Normal National Conference where uh, he, he spoke at length about his history with Normal and that he had reached what he calls a nadir, a, a low point in his time with Normal that um, has 
you know, brought him some sadness, understandably. And there's been a lot of uh, pressures. We've covered some of the stories, the the medical marijuana uh, quotes that he had made and so forth that had caused people to have their problems with his leadership and and issues with normal in general. Uh, let's start with the video first, and then we'll come back and I'll give you details from the conference. Before we started in 1991, the single biggest request, the single biggest bio, bio feedback you get, I mean, I've done almost 30,000 radio shows for normal in the last 22 years. I do all the Q&A, you know, you come, you do the questions and answers um, during the uh, call-ins. And then, if you read High Times Magazine's comment sections like I do every month, the number one thing you can see festering in the community, what we want, which I have talked about for years at Podiums at Normal, is that national march and protest in Washington, D.C. Rick Steves is absolutely correct. Don't make all the absolutely correct things to me at this lectern yesterday and said that using marijuana is a civil right, this is a civil rights issue for them, and I agree with them clearly. So, here's the tax. Here's something every single one of us can get enthused about and concentrate and fund in the next nine months. We were denied community here this weekend, and I apologize for that. I look forward to meeting and hanging out with people at normal conferences, turning on that green light, if you will, and enjoying the sacrament and the medicine with everybody here, or everybody will share it with me. <laughs> so we were denied that community here this weekend. And that's the first time in about 10 years that we haven't been able to have a medication station or a vapor lounge. April 20th this year is on a Saturday. Jill, Sabrina, and I have a meeting in a couple of weeks with the National Park Service where I hope we will walk out of there with the permit, which I have already applied for, to hold the national rally to legalize marijuana April 20th of 2013. If you don't get the permit, we're going to litigate and we will win it as sure as I'm wearing two shoes. So, what I'm asking you to do is to pull out your iCalendar, iGoogle, whatever, and commit Former to both come speak out. for the community and the protest and commit the needed funding so that we can have that proverbial national. Pro it's, Rick was right, and so was Donald. Women's rights, black minority rights, gay, lesbian, all of them have succeeded, and one of the aspects, one of the allegories of that success that we can all look at is the fist pumping or maybe joint holding protests that we all have wanted to do in Washington, D.C. And because 420 shows up on a Saturday this year, I think this is the year. So whether you own or operate a dispensary, if you're a lawyer, if you're involved in cultivation centers or cannabis testing, think about committing 5% of your after, after taxes, 5% of your profit or what's left over after you pay the bill, shall we say, to fund this national protest this year. It's something we can all get behind and enthused about. And I would suggest to you, we're not a civil rights movement unless we do that. So, yes, that is what I'm sending everybody out of here with. The idea that we will reconvene again Saturday, April 20, in Washington, D.C. It doesn't matter whether Mr. Romney is the president or anything in his face, or whether it's Mr. Obama, and we want to remind him about how great it is to assimilate and to sit up on the mountains with his true name and smoke marijuana. It doesn't matter who the president is, we are going to be in Washington, and we are going to demand that we want marijuana legalized, we don't want to be treated like criminals, and we want to end this 75-year war against us. We are the only ones.
collective way. Let's there you go. That is uh, Alan C. Pierre calling for what we all have been asking for for a long time. A 420 March this Saturday, 420 2013. We'll talk more about that and uh, what's going on at Normal when we come back. Stick around. Oh, have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. Have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. If he said he swam to China, he would send you South Carolina. Then you know you talking to that reefer man. Mmm. I like it like that. Well, I don't know what you came to do. That's right, baby. We're keeping the funk alive right here at Big Daddy Fink's Funky Roller Ring, your groovy home of soul, funk, and disco. disco. So join me, Big Daddy, every Thursday night at 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific, at the Funky Roller Ring, where every night is Saturday night. As the former chief federal prosecutor, I enforced our marijuana laws. I've come to believe they don't work. Filling our courts and jails has failed to reduce marijuana use and drug cartels are pocketing all the profits. It's time for a new approach. Initiative 502 brings marijuana under tight regulatory control, generates new revenue for education and prevention. And if we pass 502, we'll have more resources to go after violent crime instead. Yes, on 502. Everyone knows music and marijuana go together. So let's wind up our 20 after break with the Russ Belleville Show's Daily Toker Tunes. The best in pod safe 420 music from around the web. Today is Irie Wednesday, featuring reggae, ska, and other world music genres. You can get downloads and more information about all our Daily Toker Tunes by visiting music.radicalrust.com. Now... Sit back and enjoy your daily toker tune. All right, folks, before we get Irene, i got to finish up that uh, behind the headlines story and give you the uh, the straight news from vice chair of the normal board of directors, uh, Norm Kent, who published the following. And this is just in part of his total statement. You can get the complete statement at RadicalRest.com. But he uh, expresses, at the conclusion of this year's successful normal conference in L.A., members of the normal board's executive committee met with Mr. St. Pierre and advised him that at our next board, board meeting in Key West on November 28th, 2012, the following motion will be presented to the board. Shall the board of directors approve appointing a search committee for a new executive director? The chair of the board, Paul Kuhn, asked Mr. St. Pierre if he was in accord with this motion, and Mr. St. Pierre summarily and demonstratively rejected the proposal, saying he had no intention of resigning from normal and that he had never published comments to Mr. Kuhn or others offering to do so. In fact, Mr. St. Pierre, who himself is a member of the board of directors, suggested that Paul Kuhn should resign from his position as chair and he would ask the board for such a vote. Therefore, as it stands now, to be as fair and honest as possible with everyone, there will be at least two countervailing motions on the table for the board of directors at its next meeting. One asking for a search committee to seek out a new executive director and one asking to remove the chair and maybe even members of the executive committee. And again, that's from Norm Kent, the vice chair of the normal board of directors. So nobody's fired, nothing, nobody's lost their job. But uh, at the next meeting coming uh, November 28th in Key West, there will be discussions along those lines. All right, let's get to the Irie Wednesday stuff here and have a little more friendly vibe. We turn things over to Brian the Red, our reggae expert, host of Red Eyes Reggae Flashback tonight at 8 p.m. And what do we have today? Oh, I expert nothing. I, <laughs> I excel at things, but I expert nothing. Okay. Okay, anyway, uh, we've got today a, a video that was uh, from Portland Hempstock here in uh, Portland, Oregon, over at Kelly Point Park in 2010. And uh, this one was um, done by a Human and the Human Revolution, and I believe that they had a guest horn player. So here we go. All right, Tree of Life from Hempstock 2010. Portland Hempstock is proud to present the Human Revolution, featuring Jeff Peebaugh. Show you love. This one's for Jack, y'all. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
I've been known the man, the best boat you'll ever hold. Well, the pioneers covered up the wagon trains, and the canvas made it downtown. From Washington and Jefferson, they grew it on their farms, and said to make the most of it. The first stars and tracks were shown on him, the first constitution, too. This is around the world for food, fiber, oil, medicine, and fuel. And if you're blessed to see, we won't have no need for any of the oil. We can make things and mix, run our cars, do it back and mix. And sustainably And if we cut down all the trees We won't have no air to breathe We won't build the health instead We can make our bits We build a house from energy Gotta spread your own wild and free Living the way that we ought to be Gonna leave my children a better world Than my ancestors left me
Kids and marijuana, it's something every parent worries about. With Measure 80 on the ballot, many parents are worried about what message legalized marijuana would send to their children. While legalization seems scary, our experience with alcohol and tobacco show that regulation and education, not prohibition, are what best protects our children. Today, fewer teens drink alcohol or smoke cigarettes than when we were growing up. And that's because we passed strict ID carding regulations, put beer and cigarettes out of kids' reach, and educated them about the real harms of smoking and drinking. In fact, teen smoking and drinking are at their lowest recorded levels ever, and we didn't arrest a single adult for cigarettes and beer to accomplish that. Kids consistently say that beer is harder to buy than pot. After Measure 80, marijuana is treated like alcohol. You have to be 21, you have to show ID, and you have to go to an adults-only store. The message we send to kids today is just say no, and it doesn't work. Let's send the message that marijuana is for adults, and someday they can make that decision for themselves. Vote yes on Measure 8. Seventeen states and the District of Columbia have legalized the use of marijuana for medicinal purposes. Over 70% of the American public supports the use of marijuana for medicinal purposes. What does Governor Mitt Romney think of medical marijuana? So medical marijuana is legal in Colorado. One of our viewers, Bill Ferguson, asked, should marijuana be legalized for medical use? Aren't there, issues, aren't there issues of significance that you'd like to talk about? The medicinal use of marijuana is a significant issue to the millions suffering from cancer, AIDS, and other chronic pain, nausea, spasticity, and seizure disorders. I, I think marijuana uh, should not be legal in this country. I believe it's a gateway drug to other uh, drug violations. The use of illegal drugs in this country is leading to terrible consequences in places like Mexico and actually in our own country. Okay. I, I, I oppose legalization of marijuana. Former federal law enforcement officials speak out about Initiative 502. We know firsthand that decades of marijuana arrests have failed to reduce use, and the drug cartels are pocketing all the profits. Initiative 502 brings marijuana under tight regulatory control. 502 generates new revenue for education, health care, and prevention. And if 502 passes, we'll have more resources to go after violent crime. Join us in voting yes, yes on, on 502. 502. It's time for the Russ Belleville Show's Cannabis Q&A with Dr. Mitch Earlywine. Dr. Earlywine is a professor of psychology at the State University of New York at Albany and a leading author and researcher on cannabinoids and health who pins the Ask Dr. Mitch column for High Times Magazine. Get your questions ready in our live chat or call in to 971-533-7111 now. Welcome back, everybody. It's uh, time for us to get to Cannabis Q&A, so uh, get those questions ready in our chat room, and we'll bring them up as soon as we see them. But uh, first, we want to welcome Dr. Mitch Earlywine back to the show. How are you doing, Dr. Mitch? Having a great day. How about you? Uh, doing great. It seems I have to travel all the way to Los Angeles, California to run into Dr. Mitch, but I'm glad I got to. We were both at the Normal National Conference in L.A., and I'm just wondering, before we get into the news and the questions, uh, what impressions you got from the conference or maybe new things you learned? I always leave invigorated, um, eager to do more research and keep spreading the word. I also learned a few things about dabbing that I didn't really know and uh, got some nice exposure to some Republicans who are actually on our side which is always a surprise and a delight to me. Yeah, speaking of Republicans on our side, and I, I was kind of ready for her to be so dynamic because I'd seen her back in March in Texas, but uh, Mrs. Ann Lee, the uh, the mother of, the, of Richard Lee, 84-year-old Texas Republican who says she's starting Republicans Against Marijuana Prohibition. Were you as charmed by her as I was? I just thought she was completely delightful, She's got a really wonderful interactive style. She's definitely an old world Republican, but she sees this as an issue that's consistent with her superordinate goals, and she's just completely delightful. She also speaks about it all the time. We were down in the gym, and she didn't even know who I was yet, and I heard her uh, basically you know, talking to the guy next to her on the exercise bikes about Jim Crow laws and all this. It was just, it was just completely wonderful. Yeah, uh, Mrs. Lee was carrying around Michelle Alexander's The New 
you, Jim Crow. And she said her quote, this is like a Bible to me now. And, and how she brings it around and talks about that. And, and, and you could feel how uh, torn up she was about learning how racist the drug war was. It seemed to really impact her that way. Well, and this is a, you know, a Republican white woman in Texas, so I, I got to admit that warms my heart extra if, if uh, somebody who's obviously in the privileged crew appreciates that this is having a, a negative impact on folks who are really not like her. Yeah, and, and on the medical and the science aspects that were covered at the conference, there were a few people who spoke. Of course, uh, Dr. Amanda Ryman always uh, enthralls me whenever she's talking about the issue, but there was a young lady... I think she was from Pepperdine as maybe her first conference that I'd seen her at. And one of the things that she brought up over and over again was credibility and and sticking to what we know and can prove cannabis can do and not exaggerating what we think it might do. Uh, were there any others that stood out to you like that? I really enjoyed her work. She's actually a co-author with Mark Kleiman on this new book about legalization. And of the of the four authors, she's the only one who actually takes a stand for legalization. Everybody else sort of hems and haws around decriminalization. And I felt like that was really a great, uh, brave act on her part. And, um, well, in truth, there were, there were just so many great talks. I, I don't want to single out anybody for fear of neglecting other folks. So I think everybody ought to just start saving up for next year's. There we go. Let's let's make that happen. Okay. Uh, you know, let's go to the, some of the questions that we have here. Uh, one of our uh, listeners brings up that Arkansas has medical marijuana on the ballot. It's the first southern state to present this on the ballot. Do you know anything about its chances of passing? And, and do you think it can pass in the South? So my mom and stepdad live in Missouri, just a little north of there, and as I've talked to folks down in that general area and occasionally made jaunts down through there, within the cities, within Fayetteville and the larger areas, the the folks who are at least in the medical profession seem to be behind this. I think as they can reach out to their neighbors and make sure that they're uh, informed about this, it's going to go well. We know that nationally this is, you know, polling extremely well, and now it's just a matter of getting the relevant folks to the polls. So I, I do hope uh, everybody in Arkansas heads out and votes. Yeah, this would be such an amazing win if we got Arkansas in the column of, of states. I mean, now we've got a third of the United States, one third of the U.S. states now have some form of a, of a medical cannabis law. And, you know, once we get that into the south, into other regions of the country, other than, you know, just the northeast, Great Lakes and uh, the west, I think that's going to be a major, major uh, victory for us. Uh, looking through uh, the, the, the rant that I've got coming up here, a question comes to mind. You know, the Oregonian, while we were gone out there in uh, L.A., the Oregonian published a piece on the on the raise in program fees for medical marijuana here in the state of Oregon. And uh, the Oregonian came back with their familiar mantra of abuse, that we've got 57,000 medical marijuana patients, 55,000 of them cite severe pain, and somehow this is abuse. And counter to that, they say, really, medical marijuana is just supposed to be for the AIDS, glaucoma, and cancer patients. I recall one time talking to perhaps Paul Armentano about this and him saying there was more research on the, the pain, the use of marijuana for pain than almost any other qualifying condition. I'm wondering if you can expand on that. Was, am I remembering that correctly? There, there are two key points here. First of all, the American Psycho- Psychiatric Association is going to drop the whole abuse diagnosis because it's so problematic. It can be unreliable. You only need one symptom to get it, so we have no idea what the hell it means anymore. And so I feel like that's... Uh, becoming a sillier and sillier argument. The pain literature is stellar. Cannabis is superb for controlling a whole lot of kinds of pain, and particularly some of the ones that we don't normally think of. So phantom limb pain, which, I mean, as creepy as it sounds, uh, a pain that you feel in a limb that has essentially been removed, cannabis seems to help a great deal. The migraine headache literature now is just outstanding. It's clear that cannabis is superb for that and has an advantage in that Because uh, inhaled vapor has an immediate effect rather than a delayed one, it's probably better than any of the, uh, you know, medications that are taken orally. We also have wonderful data on dosage to suggest too high isn't right, too low isn't right, but right in between is is ideal. Again, supporting the idea that a vaporized approach is probably better than uh, having to take some kind of medication orally and wait for it to have an impact. And I think people underestimate how debilitating pain can be. And here's a big opportunity with literally uh, 
over a hundred studies supporting that that uh, analgesic effects of cannabis. Yeah, and especially when one of the concerns that apparently we have in this country now is the over prescription and abuse of opioid painkillers. People supposedly doctor shopping for Vicodin or OxyContin, and doctors being accused of over prescribing. When we know that uh, use of cannabis with opiate drugs can reduce the need for those opiate drugs, correct? Well, and also the, when you think about the negative side effects, nobody likes to bring it up, but opiates are incredibly constipating. And particularly if you have uh, stomach pain, you know, this is just going to make things all the worse and you get in this horrible downward spiral with it. Obviously, nobody's ever smoked so much pot that they got constipated. <laughs> and it just uh, really is curious how we won't pay attention to these side effects in part because they're kind of socially undesirable. Yeah, it, it's just so frustrating once you know the truth about this and, and how it can be so helpful for so many people. Uh, you know, and, and this uh, this thing about the pain, too, you know, the Oregonian, when they when they write about this, they, they phrase it as something to the effect of, of so many people qualifying under severe pain, which is easily, uh, not easily proven, was their words, not easily proven. And when it comes to getting a medical marijuana card in Oregon, it's not California. You're, you're getting medical records from three different visits. You're visiting an, a, a, another doctor usually to review those records. Uh, how how legit is this idea that somebody could fool at least two doctors about their pain over a period of you know three years? And that's just it. It seems uh, possible, but not at all probable. And can you imagine it going through that much effort? But also, it's such an insult to the people who really are experiencing pain. And when you think about the range of symptoms that people report to physicians and how we essentially rely on subjective self-reports to assess certain illnesses, pain is hardly outstanding as far as that is, con is concerned. What about stomach upset, right? What about nausea? <laughs> you know, each of these things are all uh, essentially subjective states. What about depression? What about mania? You know, each of these things relies on this. And the fact that we don't have some kind of neuro humma humma index of pain where you can put uh, uh, an electrode on somebody and get a number doesn't mean it's not real. And I find it just so upsetting that somebody would, would uh, essentially accuse everyone of malingering because it's possible that someone is. Yeah, and, and the other frustrating aspect to this is is in the same paper, you know, when we bring up legalization, they will claim that there's really no need for it because Oregon's decriminalized under an ounce and anybody can get it and nobody gets in trouble. And it's only a ticket. So wait, the people who would only get a ticket and have no problem are going to jump through all these hoops to get a medical marijuana card. <laughs> why, why would they, if again, there's no risk because it's so decriminalized. It's, it's frustrating that marijuana seems to addle the brains of the people who do not use it. I can agree. And I don't know what it is about journalists or newspaper editors, but they sure like to play both sides of the fence. Yeah, it is, it is very frustrating. All right. So uh, before we wind this up, just want to remind people that if you've got any questions for Dr. Mitch Earlywine that you want to just send in privately, maybe, you know, airing your issues over the, uh, the Internet airwaves isn't uh, your cup of tea. You can do so by emailing to 420research at gmail.com. 420research at gmail.com. And uh, we've got some discussion going on in the chat room about phantom limb pain. You know, talking about how it would be difficult to prove a, a severe pain, but this is a real phenomenon. I'm wondering if maybe you could uh, elucidate a bit, tell people a little bit about what this is and how doctors might diagnose it. Well, what's curious is, uh, even though the limb is gone, obviously the, the nerves that go to the brain from that limb are not gone. And so they can, uh, just like any other nerve, send a message to the brain, even though that limb is no longer present. You can imagine how frustrating this could be. It's like an itch that's basically impossible to scratch, right? The limb literally is not there. How is it diagnosed? We have to rely on someone's subjective self-report. And you can usually tell just by the grimaces and the discomfort on the face uh, as well as anything else. So uh, clearly, you know, there, there are ways to see if somebody is trying to fake it, but obviously we got to uh, believe people in a situation like this. And the thing that, that amazes me about that scenario is, all right, let's, let's pretend for a moment that the guy missing a limb is faking it. Oh, we don't want him smoking weed. That would be terrible <laughs> if the guy who lost a freaking limb got a hold of a joint. Oh, my God. <laughs> Uh, well, this is going to continue until we can finally just end the madness of trying to separate who's healthy enough to lock up in a cage for a plant. Right, Dr. Mitch? 
Sad but true. Sad All right. but true. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, it was so nice to see you in L.A., and uh, we'll see you at the next event, whatever that might be. Uh, any uh, appearances you have coming up that we need to know about? Uh, as it turns out, I'm trying to work out some details with the uh, folks at University of Central Florida, and I'll keep everybody posted when I nail that down. Ah, excellent. UCF, uh, Central Florida Knights, go Knights. Uh, we saw a few of those guys. As we do every normal conference, they're probably the uh, most well-put-together normal college chapter we've got. So is excellent. Dr. Mitch, thanks for joining us again here on the uh, Cannabis Q&A, and we'll talk to you next week. Looking forward to it. Bye now. All right. Goodbye. And uh, when we uh, come back, we are going to take a little break here. When we come back, we've got time for some rant. I've foreshadowed a little of it. Going to dig into the Oregonian, the Portland, Oregon, the state's largest newspaper, continuing its crusade of abuse, abuse of the medical marijuana program. Oh, my God. Healthy people might be smoking pot. You cut people, you smoke trees till you get what you need now. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Rust Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Rust Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Normal stands for Responsible Adult Cannabis Use. If cannabis use is causing problems in your life, consider taking a break or seeking medical assistance. Consider ceasing cannabis use if you have a family history of mental illness. Don't drive or operate heavy machinery while impaired by cannabis use. Cannabis use is not without risks, even though the risks are far less than those posed by legal drugs. That there, there was one question that was voted on that, that ranked fairly high, uh, and that was whether legalizing marijuana would improve uh, the economy and job creation. And uh, uh, I don't know what this says about the online audience, but... <laughs> my family. I think I'm entitled. You want answers. I want the truth. And you have offended a Shaolin temple. You can't handle the truth. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Radical Brand. Yes, folks, we're back from L.A. and a lot of things happening in Portland, Oregon, in the media while I was gone. Uh, some stuff came over the wires this weekend, and I just got to talk about it because this most recent editorial from the Oregonian called Medical Marijuana Fees Are Not Too High is such a frightening collision of vacuity and mercilessness that Kim Kardashian should read it aloud while wearing a Marie Antoinette costume for Halloween. This, the issue at hand here is a piece by Oregonian reporter Noelle Crombie. She called me about this, called Jen Alexander about this, a few other people in our community that we know. And the piece she wrote this weekend called Higher Medical Marijuana Fees Support Slush Fund Hurt Patients, Oregon Advocates Say. Now, in that piece, medical marijuana advocates cry foul over the recent changes in program fees for a program that is cutting what few services it offers 
while running annual surpluses. The legislature increased the annual fee from $100 to $200, instituted a new $100 lost or changed registration fee, instituted a new $50 fee to register a third-party grower, and raised the fee for low-income patients from $20 to $100 while tightening the qualification standards to qualify for that reduced fee. According to the report, the state took in $8.8 million in medical marijuana protection money, most of which it distributed to the Clean Water, Clean Drinking Water Program, $3 million, to the Emergency Medical Services Program, $1.75 million, to fl Family Planning, $1.1 million, and to School Health Centers, half a million dollars. Now, these are fine programs, absolutely. But why balance state budgets on the backs of sick and disabled people? This does not make any sense whatsoever. Sorry for the camera shot there. <laughs> Switching things around. Like I said, just got back in. All right. Uh, so look, if these are programs that you want to fund, that's great. But why do you want to balance these budgets on the backs of sick and disabled people? Most of whom are on fixed incomes. Look, if you want to make money for the state taxing marijuana, why not just legalize it for all of us and tax the healthy people? Okay, so that's Noel's piece, right? But this is where the Oregonians editorial board comes in, in their editorial that, again, was entitled Medical Marijuana Fees Are Not Too High. I encourage you to go to RadicalRest.com and click the link and read the whole thing. It's just amazing, stunning. But this is where the Oregonian comes in. Their view is that the fee increases do tax the healthy marijuana smokers. This is a quote from the Oregonian. Should Oregonians feel bad about this? Raising the fees. A little, maybe. Should lawmakers reduce fees to previous levels as soon as possible? No. In fact, you could argue that what has happened to the medical marijuana program is exactly what those who'd like to loosen the state's marijuana laws even further claim to want. The state's using pot to generate revenue. Okay, so the glaucoma patient who's living on $700 a month disability, who already has to come up with $175 to get the clinic recommendation, now has to go from a $20 annual fee to a $150 fee, $100 for the fee, $50 for the grower, and we should only feel a little bit of remorse over that? Let me go back to the Oregonian. In any case, truly sick people shouldn't blame lawmakers for the fee hikes. They should blame the people who designed such an easily abused program and, of course, the thousands of people who've abused it. This abuse we're talking about, of course, is the Oregonian shibboleth of these hordes of recreational cardholders that somehow abuse the medical marijuana program. Let me give you an idea what this abuse involves. This would involve a person collecting their medical records from three prior visits to a physician within the past three years. Now, what does it cost for three doctor visit appointments and collecting the records and the gas to go to these appointments and the time off work? Uh, let's just say 600 bucks. Maybe it's more than that. Probably is. Let's just say 600 bucks. Then you got to present those records to another doctor because most doctors won't sign the recommendation because of all the demonization that's come out from media outlets like the Oregonian about pot docs. They don't want to get their name on a list, end up in the Oregonian on some top 10 list. So they won't recommend. They got to go to some other clinic to get the recommendation. There's another $175 that you've spent on a doctor. Then the person has to fill out a bunch of forms with the state government indicating who he is, where he lives, where he'll grow marijuana and agreeing to abide by program limits and then the person has to pay the state $250 for that privilege for absolutely no service aside from protection from arrest and being logged into a database that's accessible by law enforcement that can find out that you're growing marijuana right that's the abuse for an outlay of over $1,000, a person who might have been smoking and growing the pot secretly is now doing so under state registration. Before, he was most likely getting away with it, returning nothing to the state, or he was getting caught and costing the state police, judicial, and prison resources. Now, he's pumping money into the economy, creating jobs for doctors and medical techs, and generating $8.8 .8 million to help the state pay for clean drinking water, and you call that abuse. 
Now, how does the Oregonian prove this abuse? Do they have lists of these hordes of cardholders whose cards have been rejected by the states? Do they cite any fraudulent applications? Do they provide any percentages of cardholders who've been found to be out of compliance with the program's limits? Nope. Nope. The abuse is self-evident, the Oregonian claims, because, gosh, there's just so many patients. Let me, let me go to their line here. As of October 1, there were nearly 57,000 cardholders in the state's medical marijuana program, of whom fewer than 4,000 combined suffered from cancer, HIV, or HIV, AIDS, or glaucoma, three of the conditions most commonly cited by Measure 67 supporters. That's medical marijuana law. The most frequently cited qualifying medical condition, and perhaps the most difficult to disprove, is severe pain. Claimed by 55,400 of those roughly 57,000 cardholders, People can cite more than one condition. Ha! <laughs> yeah. The Oregonian always likes to cite the 1998 voters pamphlet as if the pro-medical marijuana arguments were fooling Oregonians that there were only supposed to be 500 cardholders. Well, obviously, they've dropped that line now because they're citing 4,000 patients with cancer, AIDS, and glaucoma. <laughs> but they never seem to cite Stormy Ray's pro-argument from the pamphlet that says... From a multiple sclerosis patient, mind you, quote, there are thousands of patients like me, people suffering from cancer, AIDS, glaucoma, epilepsy, and a host of other diseases or illnesses that threaten their lives, end quote. Or the New England Journal of Medicine in the, in the voter guide that said, quote, thousands of patients with cancer, AIDS, and other diseases report that they have obtained striking relief from these devastating symptoms by smoking marijuana, end quote. Yeah, it's, it's awfully nice to see the Oregonians caveat because they didn't used to do this. They used to say, oh, well, 55,000 of these patients have cards and, and for pain uh, out of 57,000. And they never used to cite the fact that you can cite more than one condition. So it's nice of them to put in parentheses, you can qualify for more than one condition. After they've said there's 55 of 57,000 cardholders with difficult to disprove severe pain. To give you an idea how that kind of journalistic integrity works, I could say the Oregonian is guilty of libel, slander, fraud, child porn, kidnapping, terrorism, treason, and being a poorly written fish wrapper. Only one of these charges is true. And I'd have the same sort of journalistic integrity. The fact is that there are over 15,000 OMMP cardholders with multiple sclerosis alone. You want to bet that causes some severe pain? How about the over 8,000 that are using medical marijuana for nausea. How many of them have Crohn's disease or IBS or something else that causes a lot of severe pain along with that nausea? I wonder if the over 1,000 with cachexia and over 2,000 with cancer suffer any severe pain along with that. Do you suppose the 900 with glaucoma, over 700 with HIV AIDS, and over 1,400 with seizures ever suffer any severe pain? Because here's another way to write that stat, Oregonian. Over 30,000 Oregon medical marijuana patients out of 57,000 are registered for something other than severe pain. People can cite more than one condition. Some condition that is quite 